So my name is Dr. Anne Howard Davis. I'm um, an academic clinical fellow in neurology, and I'm in my first year of training as a neurologist. So please be kind to me. <laughs> so I want to start today's talk by asking you all a question. Okay. So can you put your hand up if you've had a lumbar puncture? Okay, and keep your hands up there. So I know that many of you, that was a long time ago, or and some others of you may want to wipe it from your memory, but can you keep your hand up if you developed a headache following your lumbar puncture? Okay, so a few of you. So just remember that thought for me. So for those of you who didn't put your hand up, let me explain to you what a lumbar puncture is. So this is a procedure that we use in neurology, whereby a a needle is inserted between the vertebrae in the spine to collect spinal fluid for testing. So why do a lumbar puncture? Well, this spinal fluid we use can be used to test um, for a number of different conditions. In patients whom we um, suspect MS, we test for protein bands in the spinal fluid, and we call these oligoclonal bands. We know that 90% of patients with MS will be positive for oligoclonal bands. With every procedure, there's benefits, and we've talked about the benefits, so diagnosis is a benefit for a lumbar puncture. But what are the risks of having a lumbar puncture? Well, with every invasive procedure, there's a risk that we can cause infection or bleeding um, in the local area, but these are very rare risks. More commonly, what we see is patients complaining of back pain following lumbar puncture, or indeed of headache, and that's what we're interested in talking about today. So how can we reduce the risk of headache in lumbar puncture? Well, at the Royal London, we, and all over the country, neurologists advise their patients to drink lots of water before and after the lumbar puncture to remain hydrated. We also advise patients to lie flat for a minimum of an hour after the lumbar puncture. We also know that caffeine helps to stimulate the bit of the brain that produces the spinal fluid and therefore helps to replenish the fluid we've taken away. So coffee and caffeinated drinks help to reduce your risk of post-lumbar um, headache. But what about the needle we're using? So here you can see two different needles. On the top, it's the pinpoint needle, which is a new needle, which has been designed to replace the standard needle, which has been used for many years um, for diagnostic lumbar punctures. And the question we asked in our study, does needle type really make a difference to rate of post-lumbar puncture headache? So what did we do? Everyone that presented to our investigation unit at the Royal London um, were introduced into the audit. The first 54 patients had their lumbar puncture with the standard needle, which is used throughout the trust. However, halfway through our audit, we introduced a new type of needle, a pinpoint needle. Every patient who had a lumbar puncture was called two days and seven days following the lumbar puncture um, by one of the research nurses who was unaware of what needle type had been used. They asked the questions, did, the, had it, did a headache occur? When did it come on? How severe was it? And how long did it last? And also, did you need to take painkillers to, to relieve the headache? We were also interested in what impact that headache made on the patient's recovery from a lumbar puncture. Did they have to go and see their GP? Were they admitted to hospital? And did they have any time off work? And what did we find? Well, we found what the literature had already told us, which is that pinpoint needles really do make a difference um, to your rate of post-lumbar -lum puncture headache. On the left here, we can see broad analysis, um, which shows a significant difference between the two groups, with 61% of our patients developing a post-lumbar puncture headache with a standard needle, whereas only 23% developed a post-lumbar puncture headache with a pinpoint needle. This was replicated in our conservative analysis once we had um, excluded all patients with a history of chronic daily headache. So severity and duration of headache was rather similar between the two groups, suggesting that if you got a post-lumbar puncture headache, it didn't matter which needle had been used, it tended to last as the same amount of time and was of the same severity. And what about patient's recovery? Well, here we can see a stark difference between our two groups. 
On the bottom column, you can see that four patients in the standard needle group had to visit their GP. Three patients went to A&E, and those three patients were actually readmitted to hospital for treatment of their post-lumbar puncture headache. Five patients had to have time off work, and there was an average of 0.75 days off work per lumbar puncture done. So why are the pinpoint needles better? Well, here we can see a picture of the pinpoint needle and the traumatic, or the standard needle, piercing through the dural fibres. Let me point it out. So on the top here, we can see the damage done by the pinpoint needle to the dural fibres. And compare that to the damage done by the standard needle to the dural fibres. The way I like to think of it is the standard, standard needle cuts through the dural fibres in order to get into the space where the spinal fluid lies. Whereas the pinpoint needle parts the dural fibres, rather like Moses did with the Red Sea. So how does all this affect you? Well, traditionally in MS, we've used clinical markers and also radiological markers to monitor disease progression in clinical trials. More recently, however, we've been able to develop new techniques using blood markers, urine markers, and also spinal fluid markers to monitor disease progression and therefore imply the efficacy of a drug or a medication compared to a placebo or dummy drug. So what exactly do we measure in the spinal fluid? So you heard a beautiful analogy this morning of a pub with bounces and lots of doors and women and men going in and out, which were the sodium and potassium channels. And here you can see on the top here the vulnerable demyelinated nerve with the axon, which is... Um, which the analogy told us this morning was lots of the doors open um, with the sodium potassium running in and out. As time goes on, we know that the vulnerable axon can become damaged, and we call this process neurodegeneration. With neurodegeneration, we see a release of the proteins that form the axons into the spinal fluid. These are structural proteins, or the scaffolding to the axon. And we call these proteins the neurofilaments. So this is a rather complex slide, and I apologize for it, but I'm going to simplify it by making this, um, implying this observation. So this is a study done in 2005 where we looked at um, neurofilament levels and disability in MS. And you can see here that there is a implied relationship between progression of disability in MS and the amount of the neurofilaments in the spinal fluid. So why are lumbar punctures important for patients with progressive MS? So you may remember this questionnaire which was posted on the MS research blog just over a year ago now, where we asked the question, would you be prepared to have a lump three lumbar punctures as part of a clinical trial? 127 patients answered this question, and 66% of you said yes, you would. Using that data, and also data from animal studies, there has been a new proposal to use an, a new sodium channel blocking medication, which works in the same way as phenytoin, which you heard about this morning, in a double-blind, placebo-controlled style in secondary progressive MS. This trial will allow patients to be entered into the study and given either a placebo medication or oxcarbazepine, which is a sodium channel blocker. To monitor disease progression in this trial, we will use serial lumbar punctures and looking at those neurofilaments or the scaffolding proteins I referred to earlier. This trial design allows for a shorter trial. However, patients do have to be amenable to having serial lumbar punctures. There are nurses from the Clinical Research Centre in the Lifestyle Discussion Centre, and I'd urge you to go and speak to them, and they'll be able to give you the latest um, about this trial and how to get involved. So finally, I do have one request. So we will continue to spread knowledge about the efficacy of the pinpoint needle and show how effective it is in making our lumbar punctures less painful. But we also need you. So a survey that we did at a recent conference asked neurologists that 
knew about the pinpoint needle and knew how effective it is, whether they use the pinpoint needle in their practice. And you can see from this pie chart here that the majority of the UK neurologists still don't use pinpoint needles despite knowing how much, they're, how much more effective they are in reducing the risk of post-lumbar puncture headache. There was a campaign a little while ago in the NHS where we were urging patients to ask, it's okay, uh, ask if a clinician had um, washed their hands. And the slogan was, it's okay to ask. And I'd urge you to do the same. Next time you have a lumbar puncture, make sure you ask your clinician, what lumbar puncture needle are you using? And if they're not using the pinpoint needle, ask them why. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. And if you have any um, questions about the lumbar puncture needles, I will actually have some of them in the Lifestyle Discussion Centre where you can come and have a play if you're interested. Thank you very much.